Well, this is fun. <laughs> I get the I get to interview the the mentor. A little different, you know. I was thinking about this, and I thought um, if someone were to be watching this a quarter century from now, and they really wanted to get a sense of what neurosurgery was like in this country at that time, what Emory was like, and who you were, I thought it might be best for you to introduce yourself. Not only in terms of introducing yourself to the audience, but also giving us an idea of how you'd like to be remembered. Well, that's a complicated question, um, and I expect nothing less from you. But um, my, I guess my legacy, if that's what you're asking about, you know, like most legacies, uh, began uh, with my youth and where I grew up and the influences mostly of my family. I grew up in rural Illinois, a um, small farming community of about 4,200 farmers that raised corn, soybeans, and pigs. Um, my summer jobs were lifeguarding, bucking bales of hay, detasseling corn, and castrating hogs. And um, my dad was a country doctor in that small town, one of a few in the, in the county. And so clearly he was my earliest mentor. And I'm a physician because my father was a physician. Never for a day did I really want to be anything other than a doctor. And a few days as an adult have been any different. I also was blessed to have uh, just a great family uh, beyond that. My parents and siblings, were, we were all very close, but I also was blessed to uh, not only know my four grandparents, but they lived within about a 25 mile radius of me. And then I knew on my maternal side, my Italian side of my family, three of my great grandparents very, very well. And they all really served, I think, as surrogate parents for me. And, you know, any success that I might have had in my life, I certainly owe to that upbringing and that rural um, environment and uh, the wonderful people that I, that I grew up with. And I still go back there frequently and stay in touch with the, the people that I grew up with. You meet somebody at a cocktail party nowadays, they don't know who you are. How would you introduce yourself? I introduce myself as Dan Barrow, and I usually initially ask them about themselves uh, so that I get to know what they're doing, but uh, you know, I, I tell them uh, if they ask my profession uh, that I'm a physician that work at Emory and that I'm a, a neurosurgeon there and um, uh, oftentimes uh, they want to go into a little more detail and ask you know, specifically what is that and what, is a, what does a neurosurgeon do, what's the difference between a neurosurgeon and a neurologist and so I explain that to them and explain a, a bit about our profession uh, and uh, uh, and you know how much I've enjoyed it and how rewarding it's been uh, as a career. Your, your father's a physician, but not a neurosurgeon. What point in your life did you decide you wanted to do neurosurgery? And was it a point in time or was it sort of, uh, sort of a linear learning process for you? It was, I would say it was a couple of points in time, not, not so much linear. Uh, as I said, I am a physician because of my father, but even though we both chose a career in medicine, what, what the two of us ended up doing is so different, we might as well have been in different professions. Uh, I, my, my route to neurosurgery was probably a bit unorthodox. I think m most people choose a specialty in medicine uh, because they want to emulate somebody. They have a, a mentor, a, uh, somebody that, that they admire and, and they want to grow up to be like them. And, that was absolutely not the case. I, I went to a small medical school, a new medical school called Southern Illinois University, which was uh, created specifically to create people like my father, uh, primary care physicians in Southern Illinois, because there was a, there was a deficiency of, of that at the time, and I was the black sheep. But my, my route to, to neurosurgery was uh, not uh, because I wanted to emulate a, a particular person or persons, it was a fascination with the, uh, the neurophysiology, uh, with neuroanatomy, with the technical uh, demands uh, of the surgical procedures. And I think as much as anything, the lack of understanding that stimulated in me this, 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 this thought that I, it's a field that I could um, uh, witness uh, an evolution and a change and maybe be a, be a part of that. There was a, a, a neurosurgeon in private practice at my medical school that uh, suggested that because of the type of medical school I was in, there wasn't an, a, an academic neurosurgery department, recommended I, I get out of there for a month and 
that I spent a month at the University of Virginia with John Jane, and that was another that step in that life-changing um, uh, uh, process because I realized that when I came in contact with people like Ralph Dacey, Taesung Park, who were residents at the time, Dick Wynn, who was a junior faculty member, that you could be a neurosurgeon and also be a, a normal person, which I had some doubts about just based upon what I'd experienced. And so that really solidified my decision that this field that attracts me so much is, is something that I can, I can actually do and, and, uh, and, and live a, a really rewarding and fulfilling life at the same time. You, you know, it's interesting, you mentioned the, the various things that drew you to it, one of them being the technical aspects of it, sounds like. Mm -hmm. You have to realize or think that you're good enough to do that, right? And you're pretty young when you have to make that decision. Yeah. How did you know you were good enough to do this? In retrospect, I didn't. Uh, I just had a lot of confidence. Um, I, I, I think that's a, a fascinating question and one that I still to this day ask uh, of my colleagues is that we, we have these incredible applicants for uh, you know, a few positions in neurosurgery training programs and we pay attention to a lot of things. Uh, a lot of objective as well as subjective criteria, but we do absolutely nothing to determine if they have any technical skills whatsoever. So I, as it turns out, and you know this because you've trained a lot of neurosurgery residents, most of the time they're perfectly fine. We can train people to be safe and, and, and good and sometimes even train people to be virtuosos. I think a lot of it is probably self-selection. I think people that grow up uh, being awkward, that can't chew gum and walk at the same time, probably choose other specialties. Um, uh, and um, uh, and I, think, I think most of what it requires to be a safe and effective neurosurgeon is something that most people can learn. There are exceptions. I mean, over the course of my career, there have been a couple of residents who have uh, decided themselves that they just did not have the technical skills required to be at the top of this field and chose to do something else. And it's, it's sad when that happens, and we probably could do a better job of determining that. But for me, I, I think it was just a, a level of confidence that, I, that was um, undeserved. I just felt like I could learn to do it. And within neurosurgery, then, you, you choose to pursue a particularly challenging aspect uh, in all facets, including technical. And I, was, I remember one of the first times we met, I don't know how this came up, but we were sharing quotes from famous politicians and one of the quotes that came up was a Kennedy quote that basically said, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. It, does any of that ring true for you? Do, you? do you choose to do things because they are hard? Is that, is that a significant attribute that's attractive to you? I never thought about it, but yeah, now that you ask that, I, <clears throat> I think that's, that's probably true with some of the some of the outdoor activities that I enjoy and, and certainly some of my career choices within the specialty of neurosurgery. Um, I would say I do like a challenge. I, 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 um, I, like, I like testing my, my skills to the, to the limit, I guess. You know, I, I think, again, people may watch us a quarter century from now and try to get an idea of what, who were the three to 4,000 neurosurgeons in the United States at this time, whatever the number may be. What kind of people are they? Um, and I know they're, they're different, it's a pretty diverse mix, but how would you describe the neurosurgery population in the year 2022 in this country? Well, it's very, very different than it was just a generation or two generations ago. I'll share a quick story with you that, that puts this in perspective. Uh, my dad, you know, was a country doctor, as I said, and I remember vividly the day I came home from medical school um, for a weekend and he and I are early risers and we were up having a cup of coffee about five in the morning looking out over some cornfields in my backyard and I said to my dad uh, you know dad I think I've decided what I want to do when I finish medical school and he said what's that I said I think I'm going to be a neurosurgeon and there was a rather pregnant pause after which my dad said verbatim Jesus Christ I can't imagine why anybody would want to do that but if you're going to be one, be a good one. And it was a little shocking, but my dad went to medical school in the 1950s, and neurosurgery was nearly a hopeless field back then. I mean, there was not much you could do for patients. And he knew the field had changed, but that was his 
That was his perception of the field that his son was about to go into. And the, 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 the men that went into neurosurgery, the white men that went into neurosurgery back then, because it was, it was a male-dominated field, they, they could be pretty much categorized um, in terms of their personality. I mean, they were, they were very similar. They were very driven. They were, they were focused on neurosurgery their whole life was about being a brain surgeon. They oftentimes had few outside interests. Um, the field is very different now. I think uh, it's much healthier. Uh, that diversity that you mentioned is diversity of opinions. It includes diversity of the type of people we attract to, to our specialty. And, and the thing that I, I, I mentioned earlier when I went to the University of Virginia that I recognize you can be a great neurosurgeon and also be a normal person. And I think there's a, a, an emphasis today on that, that work-life balance that maybe didn't exist um, in earlier generations. Who was the first person that you saw that in? Was it at the University of Virginia? Where, and, and what does it mean that you say that they are a normal person as well? Yeah, I, th I think what I mean by that is that their life is not entirely wrapped up in their profession. They're not defined by their profession. I think some people, um, unfortunately get defined by what it is they do for a living. And I think that may be more often the, the case in people like neurosurgeons. It's, it's, it's a difficult field. There, there are relatively few of them. It's a, an impressive thing to say at a cocktail party. I'm a brain surgeon. So I think people get wrapped up in, in, in their career and, and let it define who they are. And I see much, much less of that today in, in today's neurosurgeons than my perception of what it was like with the earlier generations. I got, I got a, a couple of rapid fire questions in this area and then we'll move on. But you know, I got to tell you, it's funny, uh, McGillicuddy, you know John McGillicuddy, mm -hmm. his thing is the neurosurgeons became so prominent part of society because of basketball coaches. Because basketball coaches are always saying, it doesn't take a damn brain surgeon <laughs> to figure this out. <laughs> Couple, just a couple quick response questions. Do you do anything on a daily basis just to keep your hands and your skills facile besides operating? Uh, what I do, not specifically to keep my hands facile, I, I, I do try and throughout my life have tried to stay physically active. Uh, I love the out of doors. I, I grew up in, in a rural area where hunting and fishing was just a part of life. It was not a question of if I'm going to hunt, it's when I can start. My grandfathers, my father, my brother, my friends all hunted and that's what we did. And so I've grown up with a love for the out of doors. I chose a profession that obligates me to live in a big city and work indoors. And so when I have free time, I do love to be outside and hunting is a way for me to stay close to nature and to stay physically active. So I've always tried to stay physically active. I, I don't have a specific routine. I, I do different forms of exercise. The one rigid routine I do have is that for 33 years I've done religiously uh, push-ups every single night. I've not missed a single night. I, I'm a little bit uh, superstitious, I, I guess. I, I began when Molly, my wife, was pregnant with Emily, our first daughter, and I, I know somehow in my mind I decided that if I did 50 push-ups every night and never missed a night that that nothing bad would happen to my daughter and my wife and, and, and that they'd have good luck. And then I, over the years, have gradually increased the number, uh, feeling that I needed to, to bankroll um, uh, some, some, some push-ups in case I ever missed a day. So I, I now do 80 a day and, and I do it religiously. I, I've been in, in a tents and hunting in Alaska in the snow. I've been um, in... in um, you know, hotel rooms, and I, I always do them. So I, I am a little bit superstitious about that. You still do them with your knees on the ground? <laughs> <laughs> Funny. A <laughs> couple more rapid fire ones. Uh, and, and people may not necessarily know all the terms you're going to use, but what was the hardest operation you, you would say you've ever performed? That's um, like asking which of my children was the hardest ones to raise. Uh, it, it depends on, 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 on when. I. I would say um, probably it, it would be uh, an AVM, uh, an arteriovenous malformation. I, I don't remember a specific one, but I think of all the things that, that I have done in my career, uh, 
arteriovenous malformations, particularly in the early years before we had good embolization techniques and before uh, there were alternatives and the only, uh, the only choice that existed was, was a surgical option. Um, it was the, the golden years of, of vascular neurosurgery when every problem had only a surgical solution, but uh, we did some crazy things back then and I'd say some of the difficult AVMs were the most challenging. Is it because they're also the longest? And to that end, what is the longest operation you ever performed? I probably didn't time it. I'm, I'm not a great case counter or, or a, a, a one to keep track of my cases. But yeah, I'd say the longest cases that I have done in my career would be early in my career and it would be AVMs. I mean, some of them several hours. Um, could they go overnight? I mean, could it be something that go from... Oh, I, well, they, they went overnight, not because they took that long, but because, because early in my career, my, my OR day started when, when George Tyndall's ended. So sometimes I didn't start, I didn't start my, my, my elective cases until mid-afternoon or, or early evening. So um, that was just the nature of the beast of starting, uh, the starting time for the junior faculty back in those days. What was the junior faculty you were in that situation's relationship with a guy like George Tyndall and how much of an impact did he have on your life? Oh, a huge impact. Uh, George Tyndall was a, uh, a great mentor, still is. George is uh, now 94 years old and still in great health. I, I just spoke to him yesterday, I keep in touch with him, uh, but he had a great influence on my life. He, he tolerated m me and, and allowed me to do these, these operations that needed to be done, deep hypothermic circulatory arrest cases, complex AVMs, uh, uh, innovative bypasses that we, we kind of created. Um, and he supported me in that. He encouraged me to publish. He encouraged me uh, to uh, get involved in organized neurosurgery and opened all the doors for me. So, you know, he and I had a relationship that I, I think was much more like a uh, like a, a father and son relationship than, than a, a mentor and mentee. Um, uh, we've remained very close throughout the time we worked together and, um, and up to this day. And so I, I owe him everything. He, he really opened all the doors for me. When you, when you look now to the future of neurosurgeons, you know, people who are thinking about going into the field now, you said that, you know, the, the, the sort of demographics have changed since you first went into it to now. When you think 25 years from now, what do you think it will look like and what do you look for to that end? I mean, we obviously know that it's somebody who's gotta be interested in neuroscience and be a very hard worker, those basic skills, but is there a, is there a sort of more subjective quality that you look for in, in candidates for residency or fellowship or whatever it may be? Well, in a word, the quality I look for is curiosity. I like people that are curious um, because I, I think that's going to be one of the, the parts of the skill set that will allow us to take advantage of the great opportunity of the future. Uh, I think the future of neurosurgery is extraordinarily bright um, for a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, neurosurgery has been a field that, despite its very small size, uh, has had a, f a, a, a focus on research. Uh, really out of proportion to the focus that other small specialties, particularly surgical specialties, have. As you know, our, our specialty requires a, a year of, of, of research, and, and it's something that is taken very seriously in most of our training programs, and it's that research that has kept our specialty vital. Secondly, the quality of people that are going into neurosurgery today has never been greater. I'm, Every time I interview somebody, I thank God I'm on the side of the desk that I'm on because I would never, I would never get a neurosurgery job from the background I came from. These young people today are so qualified. They are mature beyond their years. Most of them have done uh, significant research. They've published uh, and they're curious, which is what I think is, is very important. And I think the field of neurosurgery um, has now tools that we didn't have in the past. Um, stem cell therapies, gene therapies, uh, neuromodulation techniques that didn't exist that allow us to change the way the brain works. And combined with, with, with um, functional imaging, I think we're limited only by our imaginations and, and, um, um, and complacency. And I, and I don't I don't think this next generation that's coming into our field is going to be complacent. 
You know, neurosurgery has um, done a great job throughout its history of, of, of inventing procedures only to lose them to other specialties. Uh, carotid endarterectomy was really developed by, by neurosurgery. We do 7% of them today. Peripheral nerve surgery was developed by neurosurgeons, and we've pretty much given that up to orthopedic surgery and plastic surgery. Uh, pain uh, was invented by Bill Sweet, one of the great neurosurgeons, and multiple specialties now have taken that over. Spine surgery, endovascular therapies, neurocritical care are fields that we almost lost had it not been for the the, the valiant efforts of some of our, our, our leaders in neurosurgery. In, in the near future, neurosurgery has the opportunity to take diseases away from other specialties. I think with the ability to image uh, the functioning and the malfunctioning of the brain and utilizing neuromodulation, uh, I think we are going to be treating all kinds of diseases that were previously felt to be uh, psychiatric disorders that had no no, no treatment, let alone a surgical treatment, you know, eating disorders, drug addiction, movement disorders. Um, I think it's going to be a very, very bright future for our specialty. And I, I regret that I'm not going to be here to see all of that come to fruition. You know, it, it, it is interesting. You, you think about the future in terms of all these therapies, including gene therapies, stem cell therapies. If you start to add into that, the more minimally invasive approaches to the to the brain and to the spine, even, uh, but also seatbelts and airbags and and gun laws, so that people aren't shooting each other and causing penetrating injuries. It, it does make one wonder. Thirty years from now, when one of your grandkids maybe deciding they want to go into neurosurgery, will that be a good field for them to choose in terms of what they will be able to do and the need for neurosurgeons at that time? Well, uh, like Yogi Berra said, I'm, I'm not very good about predictions, particularly about the future. Um, um, I wouldn't pretend to know what the world of neurosurgery is going to be like at, at that point in time when my grandkids might be thinking about it. But yes, I think it, uh, if I had to ponder, I would say it's going to be a fascinating field. And sure, we may not be doing the huge uh, open operations that, that I enjoyed during my career that brought me such uh, thrills and, and uh, highs and lows. Um, but it's, it's like so many transitions when we went from, uh, from an agrarian to a, 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 an industrial society. You know, people moved from the farms to the cities and they, they adapted to the new skill sets that were required to be successful in those new jobs. And I think neurosurgery and medicine is, is no different. Um, it's um, like the spine surgeons of the 70s that had to learn uh, spinal instrumentation. It just became part of the field. The cerebrovascular neurosurgeons that have to learn endovascular techniques. Um, uh, that's, that's progress and uh, I don't think we should look at uh, the field changing and say what a loss that we, we don't do those procedures we used to do, but rather look at it as an opportunity to do better for our patients and leave the field uh, better than we found it. How old were you when you became the chairman? I had just turned uh, 40. That's, is that the youngest? Were there younger? I Must be one of the youngest. I, I think at the time I was probably, probably one of the youngest. Yeah. How did you, how are you asked? What was that conversation like? Well, it's interesting. I, I, I it was never my greatest aspiration to be a chairman. It wasn't one of those goals that if I hadn't achieved, my, my life would have been unfulfilled, truly, and certainly not at that age. At the time, when George Tyndall decided to step down, I, uh, as chairman, I was 39 years old, and I was actually uh, being interviewed for the chairmanship at Northwestern, along with Hunt Bacher, who ended up taking that job. <clears throat> and. Emory was, uh, you know, in the midst of a national search for that position, and quite honestly, it was my partners, my colleagues, that really encouraged me to um, to go through with that. Um, I think they probably decided they wanted the devil they knew better than the one they didn't know, um, but it really was. It was it was all my 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 colleagues that that were very um, supportive, and um, I think the challenge at becoming a chair any time in your career, but particularly when you're young, is that I think that transition requires you to, to put 
the careers of your colleagues ahead of your own career. Um, and I don't mean, you know, to imply that I gave up my career, not by any means, but my greatest thrills after becoming chairman were not my accomplishments, but Bob Gross getting another NIH grant, uh, uh, Rusty Rhodes becoming the president of the Congress of Neurological Surgeons, Nick Boulis, you know, inventing another science fair project to do his research in, uh, Nelson Oyashiku becoming editor-in-chief of neurosurgery or the president of the World Federation. Those are the things that really gave me the thrills. Um, and so it just expanded my opportunity for feeling good about the things our department did rather than just what I did. It is a, it is a, um, uh, a strong set of personalities that you have to manage. Um, how hard is that? I mean, you know, neurosurgeons that obviously can be, can be big personalities, they can be eccentric. I mean, that is sometimes how they're described. Are there, are there any secrets you've learned having been a chair for so long in terms of managing people? Yeah. Yeah, the, my secret is really simple. Uh, I decided very early in my career not to be a micromanager. Um, I'm just, I'm not, I'm quite honestly, I'm not smart enough to do that. So my management style has been to do my best to hire the very brightest people I can find and then get out of their way. Uh, I will do all the downfield blocking for them that they need, but I am not going to tell Bob Gross how to develop a functional neurosurgery program. I'm not going to tell Owen Samuels how to develop a neurocritical care program. Um, and that has served me well um, because I've been very fortunate to be able to surround myself with brilliant people who don't need me to micromanage them. Yeah, you know, I made some mistakes. We all, we all have. There have been a time or two in my career when it wasn't just the, the, the right person or it wasn't the right fit for them. But we've been very, very fortunate uh, at Emory to recruit and retain people that stay here. Uh, they, don't, they don't leave generally. Uh, and I think um, it's, uh, a lot of it is the, the fact that, that I don't try to micromanage them. I don't try to um, manage every aspect of their life. I think one of the hardest things for a lot of people who are going into neurosurgery is dealing with just how sick patients can be and death. I don't think it ever gets easy. But how do you deal with it? I mean, are there, uh, I don't mean to, to make it sound like it's something you can make a top 10 rule list for, but just in your own mind, how do you deal with that? I think it's dealt with, for me, best by walking a very thin line. The thin line between being so devastated by the loss that you can't get back on the horse and can't go back to work the next day and do your very best or better than your very best for the next patient and being cavalier about death I think is a thin line and we've seen people who are on both sides of that spectrum um, becoming somewhat cold-hearted and cavalier and the attitude that well you know we don't treat measles we treat difficult problems and that's just what happens in the other extreme, um, being so devastated that you really can't do your very best. Um, I think that the circumstances of death also uh, play a large role. We're, we're devastated whenever a patient suffers a complication or a loss. Some are explainable by the disease. Somebody has a glioblastoma, we do all we can for them and they live their limited life expectancy and pass away, uh, and we feel that we did everything we could for them. But the more difficult is when we think to ourselves, maybe I could have done a better job. That's, that's the one that's really hard. And the way I think you deal with that is you, you, you have to be honest with yourself, you have to take responsibility, and promise that you're gonna learn something from that that you will carry on to the next patient and do a little bit better job the next time. You know, you said earlier that almost all of your adult days you've known you wanted to be a neurosurgeon, which I guess would imply there were a few days where maybe you didn't. Was it, I mean, I, did you ever have second doubts? And I mean, building off this conversation, if you've had a, a particularly tough outcome with a patient, did it ever make you not want to continue doing this? I've never, I've never had a, a day 
as a neurosurgeon that I didn't want to be a neurosurgeon. Um, I, I, I've had days when I've come home and just wept. Um, and um, as George Tyndall used to say, and I know exactly what he meant, those patients that we have complications with walk across the foot of my bed at night. Um, and, and I understand that. But no, I've, I've never, it's, it's, it's always tried, I've always tried to use those experiences to try to make myself better. Um, but never have I really had any regrets about my career decision. I would do uh, it all over again, e exactly the same way if I had the opportunity again. You can, we can talk about this next thing or we don't have to, but you know, you, you dealt with neurosurgical issues in your own family. Mm -hmm. Do, are you do you are you comfortable talking about it? I mean, how hard is it to talk about your sister? Well, it's it's not hard at all to talk about it. Uh, it's it's hard to have dealt with it um, when it happened. But my my younger sister uh, developed a glioblastoma when she was in her thirties, which is a little bit ironic that my sister would get a glioblastoma. Um, and um, she, I learned a lot from from that experience. Um, First of all, I, I witnessed the, the remarkable care she got from my dear friend Ralph Dacey and his colleagues at Washington University. She lived in the St. Louis area. And um, the compassion that, that he and his colleagues and nurses and everybody provided for my family and her. Um, I also, uh, it really affected me in, in demonstrating up close what it's like to have to go through that with a family member because we deal with it all the time uh, talking to family members about these things and it gives you a different perspective when it's that close to, to home and I think it also really instilled in me an even stronger uh, desire to uh, support research in our specialty um, there are too many things we take care of that we just simply don't have um, good treatments for and we can do better and we need to do better and it, it's uh, through research that we're going to achieve those better results and my experience with my sister really underscored that that um, the treatment of glioblastoma at the time of her death in 2004 she lived uh, 13 14 years with a glioblastoma which we would as neurosurgeons say wow that's remarkable but it also uh, was, was an eye-opener to me that those weren't all good years and, and um, we've got to do better. And it's through research. Do you think that there should be a mandatory retirement age for neurosurgeons? That's a great question. I, um, I, I, don't, I don't think there should be a mandatory retirement age, but it, it, it is an issue that not all neurosurgeons deal with well. Um, I, I've... Um, thought about it a lot because I love what I do. I don't ever want to retire. I'm no, no male in my family, male role model has ever retired. They just worked until they were, were dead. Um, but I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing when I'm, in my opinion, when I'm 80, 90 years old. And so um, I'd like to be like Sandy Koufax and retire throwing a 100 mile an hour fastball. Maybe I've never thrown a 100-mile <laughs> fastball, but if I, if I ever have, I want to I wanna retire at that stage. I don't ever want to become a burden to my department or to my family. And I've witnessed a number of neurosurgeons who, in a, in, a, in a very short period of time, have destroyed a reputation they spent a lifetime creating because they just hung on a bit too long. And the residents are saying, who is that old guy? It, you know, up in that office up there and, you know, what's he doing still operating? I, I, I don't want to be one of those people. And so as much as I love what I do and, and I don't really want to quit, uh, I'm going to be preemptive, I, I hope. And I don't want to have my colleagues put their arm around me and say, Dan, we need to have a talk. So You're, you, you talked a lot about your, your family and Molly and the kids. And you guys just did this trip to Italy, which is amazing and inspiring, actually grown kids going on a family trip like that. I, I have three teen daughters, as you know, and I, I'm afraid I'm going to lose them as soon as they you know, go to college. But people often say with neurosurgery, it is, it is kind of knife or wife or knife or life, you know. 
you you say normal is being able to not define yourself by neurosurgery, but how you know that that balance is real though, isn't it? Oh oh, it definitely is. And any balance that I have in my life, I give all credit to my dear wife Molly. She she um, she understood uh, early in my career when I was working like a maniac and operating you know late at night. She being an oral and maxillofacial surgeon, she she understood what I was doing, but she also uh, she also provided a, a very strong sense of common sense in our in our family, and um, she had a wonderful career as an oral surgeon, but she made the decision to give up a lot of opportunities for advancement in, in her in her profession, uh, to put her family first, and she really uh, grounded me uh, and has kept me. Uh, if I'm grounded at all, I, I, I owe it to her. Um, not letting me take myself too seriously, uh, and providing an incredible home and, and uh, for our kids and, and for, for me um, that um, has allowed me to do the things that, that I've been able to do. So I, I credit her for any degree of success that I might have had in my career. And I should point out as well, for people listening, that two of your three children have also chosen medicine as professions, which is quite extraordinary. I mean, you know, I mean, you'd like to think you have an impact on your kids, you and Molly, but clearly you did. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I have friends of mine um, who have told me they, they would never let their kids go into medicine, and it, it makes me sad to hear that. I, I, I think medicine is, is the noblest profession. I, I find it extremely rewarding. I, I did not. Uh, in any way um, encourage my kids to go into medicine. In fact, they really didn't talk about it. I was as surprised as anyone when the two of my three kids that went into medicine decided to do so. Um, but I, I didn't discourage them either. And once they um, indicated they had an interest, um, I certainly supported it. And I'm, I'm very, uh, very proud of what all three of my kids are doing. Uh, but it was, uh, a, it is a surprise that two of them ended up in a field of, of medicine for sure. This, at this station in your life, 2022, so you've been chairman for over a quarter century. Um, you live in this amazing place. You have three kids who, by the way, are all married now. We got to, you got through that phase of life as well. You do arguably some of the hardest operations, the hardest techniques that one human performs on another. You do that on a regular basis. You have this wonderful outside life where you spend a lot of time in nature, hunting. You have wonderful friends and all that. What else do you want? Is there anything you want that you don't have? No. You think about that? Yeah, I do. There's really nothing I want. I, I, uh, no, I, I guess um, my only wishes are for the future of those that I'll leave behind. I, 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 I hope that my, my colleagues that I had the opportunity to work with uh, remember the years um, at Emory as having a, a great place to work, a, a collegial place to work, a, a place that was created um, that provided equal opportunity for all of them to achieve everything they wanted. Uh, I hope they um, remember me as somebody who um, put the needs of others, my, my family, my colleagues, my patients ahead of my own uh, most of the time. Um, and for my family, I, 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 hope they, uh, I hope they remember me as, as providing a, a loving and caring environment where they could achieve uh, whatever it was that they had their potential and desire to achieve. Um, but no, I, I, there's nothing uh, in my life that I want that um, I'm going to feel unfulfilled if I don't achieve it. Uh, it's been a good life. Well, thank you for this. This is this is a lot of fun. I got to say, you know, also, um, you're you're 15 years older than I am, and and our lives are sort of 15 years staggered. I think Emily was born in your life at the same time Sage was born in my life, and so forth. And it's been a real, um, it's been amazing, and I feel very uh, an honor for me to watch you, because I feel like I get that sort of look at what the future can be. And it's, it's a bright look. It, it, it's inspiring. At times when the world can seem a little dark to see what you've done, what you've been able to do, and all these, your family and your career and everything, it's, it's a real privilege. So thank you. Thanks, Sanjay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, you got it. Thank you.